any of us probably remember that lesson. And one of the points that he made that really hit my heart was this idea that I need to grow and we need to grow in our Bible study and being close and drawing near to God because that spiritual sifting is on its way, right? You know, and so that's what I've been really thinking about this past week and studied out. So I just want to share with you guys a quick Bible study that I had that was really encouraging to me. You know, and if we'll turn over to James chapter 4, uh, we're going to talk about drawing near to God. James 4, we're going to start here in verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know, let me ask you this morning, are you close and connected to God? Have you drawn near to God in the past few days? Or even right now, are you close and connected to God? You know, the truth is we live in such a connected world, right? You know, we have all these different social media sites. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, you know, we have Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Tumblr, WhatsApp, Pinterest, YouTube. We have all of these different social media sites, right? You know, and we're all so connected. You know, they say that in this world right now, we live in probably the most connected time we ever have in the history of the world. You know, we can connect with people from across countries, from across nations. You know, we can connect with our brothers and sisters in Africa, over in, you know, the Middle East. We can connect, right? We're so connected. But what's interesting is as you look here, you see, this is just a quick little Snapchat that I found, not a Snapchat, a quick little snapshot that I found. See, we're even saying it, we don't even mean to. You know, we have 7.4 billion people on this earth and 3.7 of them, they are uh, internet users. You know, and then active social media users right in the middle, there's 2.78 billion people that they've researched and they found. You know, 37% of the world uses social media. That's a huge amount of our population. You know, and, and, and you just think about this world, you think about where we live in, it's so connected, you know, across the world. You know, 50% use internet, 37%. You know, just these numbers, they're astounding. You know, and they said 21% of those people, that has grown in the past year. So since 2016, in January of 2016, the year before this, it grew 21% the amount of social media users. If you think about that, if it keeps growing at that rate, almost every single person is gonna be connected. There's some social media site, through something like this, and it's astounding to me when I, when I saw this. I said, man, we are so connected. But what's interesting is, you know, we live in such a world that's connected, but yet we're so lonely, we're so out of touch when you think about it. Yeah, right. You know, they're calling it now, in 2015, the middle of 2015, sociologists started calling it the loneliness epidemic. And you guys can research this. In, in the New York Times, one author wrote, so why are we getting lonelier? Changes in modern society are considered to be the cause. We live in, in, in nuclear family units, often living, uh, often living large distances away from our extended family and friends and our growing reliance on social technology rather than face-to-face -face interaction. It's thought to be making us feel more isolated. It means we feel less connected to others and our relationships are becoming more superficial and less rewarding. The loneliness epidemic. You know, that is what we're facing today as this modern society and in our generation. It's a connectedness that isn't really connected. It's an interaction that doesn't really help us to be interactive. Yeah. You know, and our relationships, they've become more and more artificial as modern technology has given us the ability to cut out the personal from the personal contact. You know, and the truth is, I, I researched this and it made me think if we're not careful, that our relationships with God will become and they can fall victim to this same epidemic. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the lonely, the less rewarding, the superficial interaction with God that we call connected can be everything but connected right. if we're not careful. You right. know, and being honest, the reason I, I studied this out is because I have fallen victim to this many, many times. <laughs> you know, I'm feeling far off, feeling disconnected, feeling distance from God. You know, and if you're here today and you can relate, I hope that this hits your heart this morning. Yeah. That scripture calls us in James 4 to connect and to draw close to God. You know, my first point here is draw near in action. And as we saw in James 4, 
throughout this passage, James, James uses action words to describe the nearness to God. He says, submit yourselves. You know, he says, resist the devil, come near to God, wash your hands, purify, grieve, mourn, wail, change, humble yourselves. He uses these action words to hit our hearts because the truth is that drawing close to God takes action. It takes immense action. You know, he used these words because he's writing to a group of people, if you look at this, that at one point were extremely zealous for God. They were on fire. They were zealous. They were fired up for God. And they had passion for what they were doing. And then it says, if you read right before this, that they became adulterous. They were fighting with one another. They, you know, were quarreling with one another. And they became friends of the world. They became friends of the world. And he tells them to take action. Right. He's yelling at their face. He's saying, get up. Do something. Take action. Draw near to God in what you do. Because the truth is, if we don't, we're in a very scary epidemic That's right. of having a lonely and fake relationship with God. You know, and I was thinking about this, and it just it reminded me um, of a few, you know, it was probably yeah, months ago now, um, when me and my fiance, now Alexis, we, uh, well, I was pursuing her at this time, and, uh, you know, I really liked her a lot, and, uh, and so I was pursuing her, and, and so I wanted to get closer and connected to her, right? So I was thinking of ways I could do this, and one day I had the wise idea that I was going to prank her car. You know, and so what I did, yeah, you know, that, that, that mindset, let's just yeah. prank them. Maybe that'll encourage them, right? Not at all. You know, so what I did was I got shaving cream and ramen noodles. Because that's all I had to eat was ramen noodles, and all I had was some shaving cream. And so I, her car was outside of our place, so I think we were having a game night or something. And, and I went out there, and I put it all over her car. I completely shaving creamed her car, and I, I threw my dry ramen on it. Don't know what that was for, but I was like, this will probably add to it, right? And so I threw it on there, and then I put a note, and, and I put the note, and it says, yes, your car needs a washing pump. And, and it's funny, because I was like, oh, in my mind, I was so clever, like, yeah, she's not going to know it was me at all. She's going to have no idea. She's probably going to be with somebody else. But immediately, she knew. Yeah. She immediately knew. And so in that way, what I did was I went over to her place, and I was like, hey, let me take your car. You know, do you have like 45 minutes that so you're going to be at home? Let me take your car to go wash it for you. And in my mind, I was like, I just want to encourage her. I want to find a way to get closer to her. And I don't know how that came into my mind, but it did. Shaving cream and ramen and go wash her car. Amen. It worked, you know. And now we're engaged. So brothers, if you have ramen, which you probably do, use it. My good wife. You know, and it made me think about that, right? And, you know, and even even dating couples, you know, married couples. You remember that first time that when you ask them, or that only time you ask them to be your 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 boyfriend, your girlfriend, right? And then you hold hands, right? That that moment that you finally get to interlock fingers, right? You hold hands, you're close and connected. Finally, you're like yes, and you feel it. And it's just it's it's awesome. It's awesome. You know, and it's funny because me and Lex were talking about that the other day um, in our premarriage counseling and. And she remembers uh, the, the fact that whenever we, we finally, you know, we started dating and we pulled the hands in the car, that it was like, I wouldn't let go. I don't remember that. I was just like, I was holding her hand. I was like, excited. You know, I have a stick shift if you guys ever ridden with me. And so I was like, I think I remember a little bit of it because I remember driving like, like shifting with my hands. I didn't want to let go, you know? And it was awesome. But you feel connected, right? You feel close. You feel connected for the first time, you know? And the truth is, the core of any of our relationships is closeness. Amen. The closer you are, the stronger your relationship is. You know, the closer you are to God, the stronger your relationship is. And I've been studying out Ecclesiastes, as we're going to get married here soon. Mm -hmm. And in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12, it says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You know, is your relationship with God wound together in a way that cannot be broken? He talks about this in marriage. That when one person is united with another person and they're closely woven together with God, it can't be broken. It is not quickly broken. You know, and the truth is, guys, I want to implore us this morning to have a strong, closely connected relationship with God. Draw near in a way that you have never drawn near before. You know, church, I want to encourage us to make an immense effort. To make immense effort. You know, James writes here to submit yourselves. You know, let me ask you, are you submitted to God today? A submission to God means to order yourself under God, right. to surrender to him completely as your king and as your Lord. You know, those who are baptized into Christ, 
You know, you said Jesus is Lord at your baptism. Is he Lord of your life today? You know, our nearness to God has a direct correlation to our submission to him. You know, it's like the longer you're in the sun, the more likely you are to be tanned. Or if you're like me, the more likely you are to get burned. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. The longer you scroll through Facebook at work, the less work will probably get accomplished. Right. right? Are you close to God? Are you close? Are you near? Right? Are you submitted to God? You know, let me ask you, have you gone days, have you gone weeks without reading your Bible? Have you gone time without getting on your hands and knees and praying and submitting to God? You know, maybe you're here today saying, I love you, God. But your Bible is just as dusty as the top of your ceiling fans. My call to you is clean your ceiling fans. <laughs> no, don't clean your ceiling fans. Yes, clean your ceiling fans. But clean off your Bibles and open them. Submit to God. The author, you know, here he tells us that we need to wash our hands and purify our hearts. Right. He calls them because he says they are double-minded. Yep. You know, the idea that we can serve God and our own interests at the same time doesn't make sense. It doesn't happen. You know, we cannot serve God and serve our own interests at the same time. We can't do what we want to do and call God a liar. You know, he calls them double-minded. And he says, wash your hands, purify your hearts. He's talking straight to us, telling us from afar, stop playing spiritual games. Right. God does not play games with us. He doesn't play games. Right. There is no riding the fence into the kingdom. Yeah. There's no lukewarm support group. And it's either you're in or you're out. Yeah. Yeah. You're in or you're out. And if you really want to know God, it takes a deep reverence. It takes a deep action to draw near to God. Yeah. And I want to call us, if we're feeling that this morning, if we're feeling disconnected from God, or maybe we're feeling like, God, I love you, but I'm just not connected, then get off the fence. Right. Just get in your Bible. Yeah. Pray. Read. <laughs> take action to get close to God. Yeah. Amen? Amen. My second point is drawing near in vain. And if you guys turn over to Isaiah 29, we're going to look here. Isaiah chapter 29, we're going to start here in verse 13. It says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They, their worship of me is based on merely human rules uh, they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, did you not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing. You know, this is interesting. The prophet Isaiah is writing here about the people. He's writing here about the people of Ariel that David just went to visit them. You know, and he's talking against them, telling them that merely their relationship with God is just acts of tradition. It's just generations of generations of traditions that have been passed down, and people are just acting on those traditions. They're not really going after a close relationship with God. You know, but what struck me when I read this was that he says that they came near to God with their mouth and honored God with their lips. You know, the truth is they were in the service of giving lip service to God. They were giving lip service to God, but the fact is that they drew close to God. And what this shows to me is that there is a way to draw near to God that still displeases them. There is a way to draw near to God that displeases them and that there is a proper way to draw near to God. You know, it reminded me of the first time that I ate a tamale. You know, I didn't grow up eating tamales. Maybe some of us here did. But I remember the first time my mom, uh, she had a couple coworkers at work that they would make them every year. And she brought them home for the first time. And they didn't tell me how to eat one of these things. So I, in my mind, I was like, you just just eat it. And so I, you know, I took a, took a bite of it. And I'm over here chewing on it like, oh, the voice is not breaking. I'm like, Mom, is yours this tough? Why is this hard? Like, it's not working. This doesn't even taste good. You know? And I remember my brother sitting there across the table, and he just busted out laughing because he knew that I, was, I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't eating a tamale in the proper way. Right. You know, and another time I remember, uh, this was a few weeks ago, actually. It's a little bit more recent. 
But, um, you know, I'm not the greatest cook at all. Many of you guys that know me, I don't cook. I microwave cook, and it's pretty awesome. But I remember trying to make spaghetti. And um, what I did was I took the pot, and I put water from the sink in it, and then I stuck the, the, the noodles in it, and then I just threw it on the, uh, on the stove top and turned it on high. And I walked away. And if any of you guys have ever tried that, Campus Brothers do not do that because what will happen is the bottom of your pot just burns because the, the noodles just stick to the bottom and then you ruin your pot, yeah. right? And, and that's exactly what I did. And I was, I walked back and it was like, you know, smoking and I was like, what happened? It's just supposed to boil the noodles, right? And I learned that there is an improper way to make spaghetti, <laughs> right? You know, and, and so I just think about those things is that there is, guys, there is a proper way to draw near to God. There is a proper way. You know, in verse 13, it says, They honored me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, their hearts were not in their relationship with God. It was merely heartless words. You know, the truth is, we need to draw near to God in a proper way. And in Hebrews 10, verse 19 on the screen, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You know, the writer of Hebrews right here says, draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance that your faith brings. You know, God calls us to approach with a sincere heart. The word sincere means heartfelt, wholehearted, genuine, and not hypocritical. God is concerned with his people's hearts being right. He's not concerned just with the traditions that we have. He's not concerned with the, the, the mindless acts that we live out day to day. He's concerned with our hearts being behind it. Yeah. You know, we can, get, we can get in our ebb and flow of Christianity. We can lose sight of the real reason that we're doing it. Right. The real re the real reason that we're following God is because we have a God to get connected to that loves and takes care of us. And it's not just traditions. It's not meaningless acts. I encourage us, get your hearts behind your relationship with God. Draw near sincerely. You know, is your worship today just a tradition? Is it just a tradition? You know, when you came to church this morning, was it just a tradition that on Sunday mornings I get up at 8.30 and I put nice clothes on and I come in here and sit down and listen. Or do you come here because you want to be close to God? Come on. Because you know that if I'm not here, I'm going to be somewhere else that's closer to the world and it's going to draw me away. Yeah. Right. Are you here because you want to be here? Because you want to walk out changed? Amen. Because you want to come in this room and hear something that changes your hearts and that you can take it back and do something different? Mm -hmm. Is that why you came here this morning? Mm -hmm. And I encourage us, don't make it just about the acts. Make it about your heart too. Yeah. Get your heart behind your relationship with God. Good, Bobby. You know, my last point here is God draws near. Yeah. And if you'll turn over to Luke 15, it's one of my favorite passages. Come on, Bobby. Good, Bobby. Luke 15, we'll start in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a, a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, uh, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and, where am I? and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father, said, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, 
Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know, this is one of my most favorite passages in the Bible. It's so encouraging. The passage, it's an incredible story of a father who longs to be with his son. It says that the son took his inheritance right with him, and he goes off only to find an empty and unfulfilled way of life. Yeah. Right? He goes, and he's trying. He doesn't even have the food that the pigs are eating. He's, he doesn't have anything. He's in need. He finds an unfulfilled way of life, but he decides, after coming to his senses, to return back to his father. Yeah. You know, the truth is, we can be just like the son sometimes. We can drift away. We can get disconnected from God, whether it's through sin yeah. or whether it's just what we do we just get disconnected and we don't draw near to god in our, in our daily walk with him right we go off and we do what we want to do you know and, and we feel far from god and we get distant you know we can wander off but what's so encouraging is that the father in the story who represents god says that he saw him from a distance he saw him, he was looking for him he was looking for his son to return home you know i can just imagine him sitting there waiting waiting for his son as he's there in the distance and he comes back and he sees them. And what does he do? He doesn't sit there and say, okay, I'm going to let him walk all the rest of the way. But he runs toward him. Right. He runs toward his son. You know, the truth is that God runs toward you. Yeah. That God runs to you when you come near. We saw that in James 4. He says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Let this encourage us this morning, church. That if we take the action to draw near to God, that God is drawing near as well. That he's there. He's making approaches. He's making steps to get close to us. And that's what he wants. He wants to be close to his children. Mm -hmm. He wants to be close to you and I. To share the best gifts. To eat the best food. Right? To celebrate the best feast with us. Right? You know, he says, take off your Aggie ring. Let me give you one that's even better. Amen. You know, some of us were like, I'm not going to take my Aggie ring off. Take it off. There's one that's even better waiting. Amen. Right? We ate barbecue on Friday night at Liz and Marcella's wedding from C&J. And man, that was some good barbecue, right? And many of us are probably going to get some more of that at the church. Yeah. He says, but no, there's even better than that. There's a feast that's waiting. There's a feast. I want to give you the best when you come back to me. You know, and we serve a God that longs to come near us. And in fact, he always is. In fact, he always is. Yeah. That's why I numbered him. You know, and it reminds me of a story of an elderly couple. Uh, that I once heard about. It says this elderly couple was like uh, was every good old Texas couple, couple, right? You know, who owns the the husband owns uh, a single cab, you know, pickup truck. You know, and they have a dog and their wife, just like every good Texas couple. Right? <laughs> maybe maybe you don't fulfill that stereotype. <laughs> but you know, the the husband owned owned a single cab truck, and, and when they were you know when they were younger, they used to sit right next to each other in the cab.